All right, hey everybody, my name is Ben Zeno, and welcome to today's episode of The Wild Report. You're about to hear from Dr. David Steen, an award-winning science communicator who has devoted his time to studying the natural world and educating the public about ecology through social media. His studies usually focus on the interactions between wild animals and the swiftly changing landscapes around them, especially how human activities may be impacting wildlife population dynamics and behaviors. He is also the executive director of the Alongside Wildlife Foundation and research ecologist at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. First of all, thank you, Dr. Steen, for being here with you today. I think that all of my listeners and viewers will be as inspired by your work as I am. I guess we should start with the basics. What was it that initially got you interested in the environmental sciences? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on the, on the program here, Ben. Yes. I've really been looking forward to it. Uh, the question is, how did I get involved in the environmental sciences? And you know, as long as I can remember, I've been looking through streams, lifting up rocks for salamanders and crayfish, walking through the woods looking for snakes, and somewhere along the way it became a career. Um, so I don't think I knew exactly what I wanted to do until I was an undergraduate in college. Okay. Took a general ecology course, and that really opened my eyes. Uh, and it helps me realize that these animals aren't just randomly careening across the landscape. They're living in populations and they're responding to their habitat and their conditions in the area. Right. That's awesome. So basically, you know, you were always, you always enjoyed the outdoors, but really once you got into college, that's when, that's what really sparked your interest in, in the science behind everything. Yeah, that's true. And I think I also gained an appreciation for their conservation status. Uh, we are having huge impacts on the natural world. And I want to dedicate my career, my energy, to identifying the problems and helping come up with solutions. Right. That's awesome. All right. So, you know, you've accumulated quite a, a massive following on social media. Uh, on Twitter, you have over 27,000 followers. And the best part is it's all, it's all science. It's all scientific content. Uh, so as you've continued your outreach in that area, have you noticed any kind of increase or decrease in the public interest in science on, on social media? That's, that's a good question. It's hard to answer because my experience online is biased towards the people that I interact with. And so I see a lot of people that are interested and I see a lot of people tell me that I've helped change their perspective towards some of these creatures that we, we care about, like snakes and turtles and right. things like that. As to overall society, it's hard to say. Um, but I sure hope it's the case that more people care about these animals. Yeah, definitely. All right. And, and as I've already mentioned, you've conducted you know, a, a huge variety of research projects over the years, many of which focused on the anthropogenic activities and how they're impacting wildlife population distributions. Uh, one of your studies I took a look at investigated how road mortality was impacting nearby turtle populations. And it was interesting to me what you found. Can you just briefly explain to us uh, you know, what the findings were? Sure, this was a project that I started when I was getting my master's at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry working with James Gibbs. Um, basically, we know that turtles are being killed on roads. Right. Most of us have seen a turtle trying to cross oh, yeah. or a turtle getting hit. Right. And we know that's a concern for that individual turtle. And, and what we wanted to know is, is, and that changes it from an individual level concern to a conservation biology level concern. Now turtles have this really neat natural history strategy. Lots of babies are eaten. The eggs and the babies are eaten by predators. Some right. just don't make it. But once a turtle is an adult, it's really kind of a tough creature, mm -hmm. and there's not much that can mess with it. Right. And so that high mortality of the babies is offset by these adults living for many, many years reproducing. Right, right. So that's a fine strategy, as long as the adults are surviving. Mm -hmm. But that's who's getting killed on the roads. It's the females, the adult females, because they do something that the other ones do not. They need to go nest. And so they're right, crawling right. out of the water, and that brings them into conflict with cars. Okay. So that's the setup. And long story short, might be too late for me to say that, but uh, the what we found was that where wetlands were surrounded by a lot of roads, the populations were biased towards males. 
and that's probably because the females really? kept getting killed. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that was the field por portion of the study. And then we looked, we went to the literature, and we said, let me, let me see every time somebody has published about the sex ratio of turtles in the country. And we compiled all the data together, and we found that over time, over the last hundred years, the proportion kept getting more and more male biased. Wow. And we think that's consistent with a large scale road effect across wow. the country. That's, that's amazing. So, you know, basically, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you found is that, you know, even though on the outside there's this kind of temporary, this kind of superficial stability as far as the actual numbers went, the road was still disturbing the population dynamics on a deeper level that would have future consequences far beyond what we could imagine. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, for some of these really long-lived creatures like turtles, there could be a population that's going extinct, a, lo a population that's going locally extinct. Right. It could take decades, and you could still have these animals there, but the, it's declining and declining and right. declining. And is, but, yeah. and is that common to see that kind of you know superficial stability, but over time these populations are changing, and if you look at trends... Do you see that a lot in your research, or is that more with the long-lived animals, like you were saying, like turtles? It's a mix. Okay. So pop population modeling is a really exciting field. Basically, you can figure out how long animals live, how many babies they have, when do they start breeding, and then you can model what the population does over time, and then just naturally. Right. And then you can introduce some of these threats like roads or increased predation, things like that, and figure out how the population changes. Right. Awesome. But those, but those effects. I mean, it could be 50, 100, 500 years down the road, yeah. and you could predict it now. Uh, so yes, there there could be a population there, but it's really interesting to kind of dive into and figure out those dynamics. What right. what what is that population doing? Yeah. yeah. So you know, as a result of this research, you recommended that things like you know fences or culverts be built on the roads to help, you know, female turtles as they're travel traveling across uh, to keep them from being hit by cards. Uh, it might be touchy, but have you actually seen new measures enacted as a result of the research? Or are people still considering these environmentally beneficial solutions too cost prohibitive to be put to practice? Sure. Now, I can't take credit for any road mitigation structures. My research is, you know, one large part of a conservation biology movement right. and, and other research that's similar. Um, I would first say, I think I would encourage people to keep roads from being built around wetlands in the first place. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that way we can be proactive and we don't right. necessarily need to worry about how to fix things after the fact. Right. Now that said, culverts and fences have been put in place uh, a number of places in Ontario. Uh, the Lake Jackson Eco Passage is a famous one. Uh, the Paynes Prairie Eco Passage, also in Florida, is another example. Right. These things are very expensive, mm -hmm. but they are effective. Right. Um, so it, it is happening. That's good. And are you seeing, you know, more? Are you seeing this being used more widespread as more research comes out that you know backs up that yeah we need to do something? Are you seeing more people start to resort to these methods? It does seem as though more people are acknowledging that roads are a conservation level issue, not only for turtles, but lots of other creatures too. Um, and, and I do see an increased amount of um, people talking about what to do about it. Right, right here uh, on the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, we're on Jekyll Island, and there's a causeway running from the mainland to the island, and a lot of diamondback terrapins get, get hit on that road. Right. And, Brian Crawford, he was a graduate student at U University of Georgia. Now he's a postdoc uh, in collaboration with Michelle Kaler here at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. I've really done a lot of work figuring out how to identify the problem, how can we fix it, and now that's what we're doing right now, trying to figure out some long-term mitigation strategies. Right. So overall, though, the best mitigation strategy is proactive, just not having the roads in the first place. If you ask me that that let's remove the conflict before it ever happens, exactly. that we yeah. don't have to scramble how to fix it later. Right. All right. And uh, I've already learned a ton from speaking with you. I know that my viewers and listeners have as well. I do have one final question before we finish up. 
I promise I'll keep it short. Uh, in your opinion, which human activity, which one human activity, is the most threatening to the ecosystems and wild animals which are now being forced to function alongside mankind? Sure. We hear a lot about climate change, and right. that is an important threat. Okay. However, today, the biggest problem facing wildlife populations is the loss of habitat. Really? It's the complete loss, you know, if we're going to pave it over, make a highway, make a development, a new city. And it's kind of uh, also relating to a decline in habitat quality. For example, some forests and habitats have these natural ecological processes and disturbances. And sometimes we can manage it so that those disturbances stop. So right. habitat loss and a decline in habitat quality, that's the problem. Okay. I mean, coming from someone who studied them for so long, I think it's you know amazing to hear from you that something which is globally known and widely debated about, like climate change, isn't even as important maybe as you know the ecosystems that we all have, you know, right behind our houses or at a local park. So, in your opinion, are these ecosystems, you know, getting these worked out, you know, working on conserving these more important in the short term than starting starting you know larger you know global scale initiatives? Sure. And I guess I would say we don't necessarily have to pick one threat to focus on. Right. Uh, habitat loss is extremely important, but climate change is coming, and, and it's starting, and we're starting to see those effects. So I would, I, I'm not saying don't pay attention to it, right. but, but definitely think about the habitats in your neighborhood, in your backyard. They are important for a number of wildlife species, especially if they're connected. Right. Now, it's not necessarily appropriate for all species, and that's why we need these wild areas too for things like exactly. umas and grizzly bears things like that right all right well that about wraps up my interview dr steen thank you so much for being here uh for everyone listening and watching right now please be sure to check out his twitter page it's awesome there's all kind of different snake ids on there people send in pictures 24 7 so if you're ever looking to get a snake you find identified send a picture to him i'll have a link to that in the description and also, check out the Alongside Wildlife Foundation website. It's pretty cool. They do some great work. Uh, Dr. Steen, do you have anything else to say? Nope. I appreciate the opportunity to chat today. All right. Thank you, sir. This has been Zeno, The Wild Report, signing out.